All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, all. Every one of you who is out there, who is uh, helping out to ensure it's safe. Good far. afternoon. Yeah, thank you. Welcome, everyone there who is. Good afternoon, everyone. Out uh, to ensure it's safe and healthier world of work. I welcome you all to Ayosh. West Africa North Central District meeting today, July 20th. My name is John Afangbe. I'm the chair of North Central District. So you're welcome to this meeting. Uh, today we have uh, Mr. Abdullahi Fatou speaking to us on uh, persuade, persuasive techniques for safety advocacy persuasive techniques for safety advocacy. As professionals, our safety message may, may be logical and uh, sensible and reasonable, but that does not really imply that everyone will buy in. Winning people to our cause require persuasion. So this afternoon, Mr. Abdu, Abdullahi Fatou will be doing justice to this uh, topic on uh, persuasive techniques for safety advocacy. Who is Mr. Fatou? Mr. Fatou is a chartered member of IOSH and a graduate of microbiology from University of Lorraine. He holds HSE certifications in, uh, you know, such as Nebosh uh, Diploma, International Diploma. Nebosh HS Certificate in Process Safety Management. IOSH Managing Sustainably. IOSH ISO 9001, ISO 14001, ISO 45001 Integrated Management System Lead Auditor Certification. Mr. Fatou was a medical representative for a foremost indigenous pharmaceutical company and is currently the lead accident investigation uh, for NNPC, Exploration and Production Limited. Mr. Ab Ab Abdullahi is also a comrade. He's a branch vice chairman of uh, Pengasin. Join me this afternoon to welcome Mr. Fatou to do a presentation on persuasive techniques for safety advocacy. Mr. Fatou. You are you have the floor now. To make your presentation. Good afternoon, Chairman. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Abdullahi Fatou Mohammed. Uh, I'll be making this uh, presentation as um, rightfully introduced uh, by the chairman. The topic for discussion today is uh, persuasive techniques for safety advocacy, with a sub um, uh, title saying uh, convincing management and workers uh, with the right content and, and context. You want them to actually um, um, uh, listen to you as a safety, occupational safety and health um, officer. During the course of this um, presentation, I will be guided by the following outline. I will introduce um, the topic. We will discuss um, what the persuasion really is, and um, we will talk about um, the three. Um, core principles of um, doing this uh, right from old Aristotle himself, the ethos and pathos and logos um, approach. We hint uh, briefly on the uh, communication skills and uh, we'll talk on um, um, influence, how to make people say yes to what you want them to, to do or anything you ask them uh, ethically, ethically, and then we'll be coming to um, overcoming resistance, then we'll be concluding. Uh, we're we'll discussing um, additional resources um, which we'll be providing at the end of the uh, presentation.
my story. Uh, during the course of uh, my uh, being uh, introduced, um, I purposely put there that um, I, uh, I was once a sales and marketing. I was a medical representative for a foremost uh, pharmaceutical company in Nigeria. I did two years, or almost two years with them. Why am I mentioning this? There, I had interface uh, with, um, uh, with the hospital for the bulk of the two years because my work entails me uh, meeting doctors, pharmacists, nurses, and there's not how you meet those people that you won't actually see, um, you won't see their patients. I've seen patients, I've seen people in pain, and I've seen people actually get out of school. I've been there when patients were being brought in. And I, while I was growing up, I lived close to one of the, uh, the biggest hospitals in Lagos, that is a national orthoped orthopedic hospital, Igbobi. I've had them the opportunity of being in the hospital and seeing patients. Oh, who, who has never seen patients before? I've witnessed people die. Most of us have seen people die. So, but um, this story of mine, actually one of those um, driving force, when I found myself uh, in a safety role, uh, you know, secure life and uh, the well-being of uh, people under our care, I will make sure that um, they return home. The core message is that uh, we want people to return home from work as safe as possible, sound and safe, without ill health and uh, with um, the right um, frame of mind. Now, the purpose of this presentation is to equip listeners, that is you and I. And uh, before I go on, I would like to state again, uh, this is a two-way two arrangement in the sense that I've come here to make presentation I have an open mind and I'm willing to learn as well. So you will learn, you learn, I learn. So the, is to keep listening as with persuasive techniques for effective safety advocacy. And um, there's a reason why we must do that. Uh, for you to be a safety officer, occupational safety and health, your work is such that um, you must pour in passion into it. You must be compassionate about people and you must be passionate about what you do. The moment you are losing your passion or you are not okay with your workplace, it is better you leave. But while you are still there as a safety, as an occupational safety and health practitioner or professional, you it is it is it is expected of you to make sure you deliver, you you give it all or your all, because there's are always lives on the line. There are always lives on the line. What we we'll do is to make sure that uh, people don't die on our shift. People don't die in the company we belong to. People don't get injured physically and psychologically. So before we proceed, I would like to define what persuasion is. According to Britannica.com, persuasion is, uh, is the process by which a person's attitudes uh, or behavior are, without duress, influenced by communications from other people. Uh, the relevance of uh, persuasion in safety advocacy includes encouraging, uh, encouraging compliance, creating emotional connections, effective communication, overcoming resistance, and probably, you know, behavioral change, cultural change, etc. Persuasion has, has a very uh, very uh, what we call uh, uh, principles that uh, that uh, that that's underlining it. But um, the first thing I'll be discussing is uh, the the key elements, which is called the ethos, pathos, and logos used by Aristotle himself. So, with key, uh, ethos, it is an appeal to ethics. You try to appeal to credibility. You try to appeal to authority. It refers to the credibility and character of a speaker or writer, which can significantly influence how the audience receives a response to a message. Down the presentation, I'll be giving you um, tips and tips on how you can actually uh, use this to your, to your advantage. To build ethos, you must establish trust. You establish trust by sharing relevant personal experiences and credentials. When I mean experiences, you, uh, if you are in a situation uh, let me start an example of um, a, a question health and safety situation whereby you are giving an example. You are you've done your risk assessments. You are communicating 
the controls, the hazards that are present in that workplace and the controls which you have made present for it. And people are not listening to you or they are listening to you, but they are not getting a message. You might need to bring relevant personal experiences. If you have one, you don't need to tell a lie. If you have, you should bring it to the fore. If you be Being in a place, actually being aware of hazards. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, okay. As a result of um, hazards in the place, person not listening and not actually paying attention to the hazard and the controls in a particular workplace and then getting injured. As a result, you should bring it to the fore. Probably they lost a limb, probably they lost the finger or what you should actually bring it to the fore to make them understand that. It can be you. The statistics we see on a daily, on when we read our performance indicators, are uh, people. They are not just uh, numbers. They are people. When you say somebody is, 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 is injured, somebody is that, is somebody, somebody is dead, is somebody. It's not just numbers. And you should be able to demonstrate expertise. And I can understand the level at which uh, we place this presentation is on implement level, if I'm correct. I'm sure we'll have um, varying people from different spectrum on this call today. And um, um, we have people that are just uh, beginners. We have people that have been practicing for over 20 to 25 years on this call. But um, I would like to uh, bring it to, as in, find a middle ground where we can all learn from this. Once you want to demonstrate expertise, it's easy for somebody that has years of experience under his or her belt. But for somebody that is just starting, yeah, you can demonstrate expertise by using data and research to support your safety messages. It's expertise, it's expertise, it, it, whether it belongs to you or it belongs to somebody else, as long as it's the correct expertise. You can use real life examples for, of safety interventions or incidents. If you have, if you witnessed some successful um, interventions before, bring it to the fore, use it as an example, put it in the stories you tell, put it in convincing either management or staff like your other workers, use them. And if there are incidents as well that you are trying to actually prevent, by the methods you are currently using. You should cite the example of where the methods were not there and isn't actually happened. And then uh, you, you should engage, when you engage, this help engaging your audience and connect to the content. To maximize your ethos as a safety advocate, share personal, bag, personal professional background, cite relevant experience, like I said before, provide evidence of past successes in improving safety. If it's you have done that before, you can cite it. But if it is um, uh, from other companies as well, you should cite that as well. There are inst inst instances of where you can get this information from. The HSC uh, uh, website is one of them. The CBS uh, uh, website is one of them where incidents have actually occurred. And the um, root causes of those incidents have been, have been unearthed. And the um, control measures that were put in place are, are, are announced. You can say that if these control measures were to be in place before the incident, the incident couldn't have happened. You can use that as an opportunity to guide your people that you don't need to get to that incident before we recognize the control measures that are put in place. Now, next to the line in line is the is the pathos. Pathos is the art of convincing an audience to accept an argument by creating an emotional response to an impassionately, impassionately or convincing story. Uh, on this note, I would like to cite an, a small example. Emotions must be tied to the message. Down line the presentation where we have that um, we do all between with this advocacy we are actually discussing is through communication. And communication is a part content and part context. What we are discussing now is the content of the communication because communication is meant to actually convey meaning between two persons where there's a feedback loop trying to make you understand that is the message being gotten or not. Now, when you put emotion, emotion is part of that part that if you add to your message, your message goes home. The example I want to cite is this. When there's an emergency, probably there's a fire, and uh, you are supposed to raise an alarm, but the emotion you are using to cite the alarm, to, to raise the alarm, must be corresponding to the to what is actually happening. You can't say, fire, fire, there's fire, there's fire. Nobody will listen to you. But when you shout with all sense of urgency, people recognize, even though they don't hear you, when they see the way you're running and the way you are frantic, they know that something is up. 
you must put emotion to your message. We need to do this. There's need for us to actually add emotion to whatever we do, either for verbal or either written. There are ways you are you advocate. You must make sure part of the ingredients you do, you put you add emotion to it. That is emotion on the part of the person giving the uh, uh, advocacy, and you must try to evoke the person you, you are giving advocacy to, evoke some sense of emotion in them. One of such examples is this. You are trying to, um, particular control measure to say that, okay, you must um, make sure on the speed limits in this, uh, in this our premises, our workplace is 10, 10 kilometers per hour when you drive. And you must drive without making calls and you must be on a seatbelt. This is for your safety and safety of others. Now, somebody might not get that. To drive the point to, you might just say, there can be collision, there can be incident, there can be accident as a result of you not abiding by this rule. You might still not get it. But if you paint the scenario and say, how many friends do you know? How many people do you know in this workplace besides them? How would you feel if you happen to, to, to hit them or cause an incident that takes them? It means you, you will not be able to see them. They might be injured and, or they might die. As a result of you not using your seatbelt, as a result of you not abiding by this uh, by this stipulated uh, speed limit, as a result of you being distracted while driving, do you want to be the cause of somebody's death? That's where it will strike home. You have evoked some bit of emotion from them. They don't want to be that person that's going to cause somebody pain. You should, when you use that, it makes them to be to be compliant. So effectively use a, a mix of pathos as an advocate. You must connect with your audience. You want to understand your audience, audience's value and, and their concerns. This is very crucial. You must use story storytelling. You must share compelling stories. And I must remind you, these stories must be true. You don't need to actually make up uh, make up stories. People see right through when you lie. You must tell them true stories and those true stories are about. It might not be stories that are actually you witness. It might be a story you are, you actually read through a report. If you shared, find a way to weave your report when you are advocating to make it in a story form, people tend to listen to story. Storytelling is not just a tool, but a powerful one for connecting with audiences' emotions. You strive their emotions. I don't know, you want to try this, practical story. The moment you are a gathering and you're about to give a presentation or you're about to address people, children, we all have inner children in us. Once children are with you, say, story, story. Once they reply, respond, story. There's a calm, there's a pause. People want to listen. You want to listen to what you have to say. What you have to say, you shouldn't um, shy away from using this in, in your arsenal. You must utilize visual and verbal techniques. When the advocacy is verbal, make sure you use it to your advantage. We'll come down to it when we discuss um, um, some context. We are discussing contents now. The context of of communication you, uh, through advocacy. So utilize visual and verbal techniques. Your verbal techniques must be must be top notch. You must know when to raise your pitch. You must raise one to adjust your tone. You must know those tone and pitch must correspond to the emotion which you are trying to convey. If it is all seriousness, your voice must be up. If it is um, a, a sympathetic um, a message you are trying to get across, it's more your voice must, 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 must modulate according to the emotion you are trying to, 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 to project. Now to the third part of um, of the uh, of the of, of this um, uh, our discussion is a logical argument, which is what we call logos. We've discussed ethos. We've discussed. We just finished discussing pathos. This is logos. Logos appeal to logic and reason. You aim to persuade your audience through rational arguments, through facts and evidence. You use logos in your safe advocation advocacy moves by utilizing logical arguments logical arguments. You construct clear, coherent, and logically sound arguments. This involves What's presenting premises, premises that lead to a conclusion in a rational That's manner. Yeah. In a rational yeah. manner. It's very, very important that Very, very important. You must use evidence and data in, 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 in your advocacy. Statistics, research findings, case studies, and other evidence are used to support claims. This helps to substantiate arguments and make them more convincing. Uh, this is Nigeria, but uh, for the uh, 
for the context of um, international audience that are listening to us, we have um, rules and regulations that you, you abide with as a country. You must use them. In Nigeria, we have the uh, Factory Act, we have the Occupational Safety and Health Policy in Nigeria, and we have the ILO Conventions and Recommendations, uh, which Nigeria is, is a signatory to uh, we ratify them. You can use those things once you discuss with either management or, or, or fellow workers to convince them that uh, what you're actually telling them is not just um, from the top of your head. These are basic principles and policies and regulations we are trying to convey to them. You must use examples and anal analogies. Provide examples, comparisons, and analogies that help illustrate and clarify complex points that can make abstract ideas more understandable and relatable. Storytelling, you bring examples and analogies in whatever you want on your discussions to help drive your point home. You must um, structure, you must use structure and organization. You must present your information in a well organized and systematic way. Your information, the information, the content of your advocacy must be well structured and must flow into each other. It must not be haphazard. It must be linear. It can be, it can be divergent, but it should flow. It should flow accordingly. And it must be well connected. It must be linked to each other. And a clear structure helps the others follow the argument and understand the logical progression of the ideas you are trying to disseminate. You must be consistent. You must ensure that your arguments are consistent and free from contradictions. You must not contradict yourself because um, you might lose them. You are telling them this is black, this is black, then suddenly it's white. Then there's a there's a look of confusion on their face and say, well, what's, what's going on? You just said it's black, now it's white. What's going on? Now, communication skills. I would have, um, not to lengthen our discussion, there have been previous discussions on this platform before. I can I remember the first uh, first meeting I attended as an IOSH member, June 2023. Yeah, June 2023 was actually was the was on communications. I'm sure if you search on YouTube, uh, something communications, you will see the um, YouTube the, the the YouTube video. But uh, like I said, you can reach out to that and see and find a way to actually brush up brush up yourself on communication skills. But I'll be discussing some some parts. On, on communication. Like I said, the first three um, um, uh, items I discussed are actually based on what we call the content of um, what we're trying to put together as an, as, an, as an advocacy. You will remember, you agree with me that communication is more about more than words. It's about conveying meaning, conveying meaning between two persons, the, the initiator and the receiver, where we have a um, feedback loop in between to, for you to actually know, am I being understood? Where there's a feedback from another and telling this person that I can't hear you, I don't understand what you are saying. When you hold, when you look at uh, the, the the communication as a whole, which is a mixture of um, it's a fusion of uh, context and uh, and content, what percentage of that message is context? What percentage is con content? According to Google, or the personal communication I, I held, he, who is a kind is a vast person in uh, what we call communication um, skills. They, they explained to me that um, what they are, from their years of practice, they've noticed that um, um, communications is basically just seven percent. The content of a communication is basically seven percent. Why bulk of it? What we say ninety three percent, where thirty eight percent is just the tone how you convey your message. Why the rest is body language, which went through um, eye contact, opalesics, appearance, that is objectives, gestures, that's kinesics, facial expressions, opalesics, as well. We'll see as we progress down the line. When you are giving your message, no matter, uh, matter how much your message is, you should break it down to know that some percent is just as effective or as loud or as touching as the message is. What makes it so touching is that the bulk of it is the context. 7% of what is being understood is just, it's just, it's just the word. 93% is, is, the, is the context. Like I said, context is key. To break down context, you must know that um, I use this, I use a mnemonic to tie this, I call it PACO VC. There's what we call proxemics, there's objectives, which you will actually call artifacts. Artifactics, and we have kinesics, we have oculesics, and we have vocalics and chronemics. What is proxemics? Proxemics, in short, is just a summary to say 
about uh, spacing when you when you make your presentation or when you are making advocacy to people. There are some advocates you make, you make it in close proximity for it to be felt. There are some advocacy you make, you make it probably uh, addressing a gathering. There's a, the distance you stay between them, depending on the context of what you are pa 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 passing across to them, the distance between you and them actually matters. It might not be just physical distance. There's a psychological distance to really matter. That means there are times you need to be close to the person you want to pass the message across to. If you sound too distant, that's why the fact that are physically close, your message will not be will, will, will not be will not be listened to, will not be adopted. Well, objectives is about um, um, the pieces of, um, of 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 objects surrounding your 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 communication, the clothes you wear, the 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 the, the, the your fashion taste, your glasses, everything about you, and probably the objects around where you are actually making this presentation. Are they favorable to what you want to do now? You must check to be able to ascertain because. Once you make an advocate, so you're trying to communicate, and the the proximity is not is not okay, and the objects are not fine. Probably you are trying to talk to people that are sweaty. They are they are, they are, they are, they are not going to listen to you. They are tired. They are not going to listen to you. The temperature or around them is hot, and they, you know they are thirty. But it's time to just go shower and go. And you are trying to address them. They might not listen to you. you must ah, pay attention. To you. Are you the only one? Yeah. Asking? You must pay attention to to this point. Uh, we'll discuss proxemics who are who are an objective. Kinesics, kinesics is um, uh, all the movements with regards to the presentation. How you go about them. Oculistics is um, your eye gaze, your eye contact. Um, the robots will say the the eye the, the talk is in the eye. When I talk to you, you must you must maintain eye contact for me to actually pass my message across to you. At times, you do this through phone. The way you connect a person on phone actually matters. Though you might not be seeing each other, but the way you connect actually matters. Then vocalics, this is your tone. This is the volume of your speech. This is how you modulate your rhythm. This is how you pass your message across. The pauses, once questions are asked of you, the acknowledgments of um, when you, the, 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 the pause to show acknowledgement, the pause to show reflection, these are all part of what we call Vocalics, then chronemics. Chronemics deals with timing. When I say timing, timing varies. You understand the time the discussion is going to take. The time, actual timing where you are actually dis disseminating the information actually matters. If it's closing time, somebody is going, you might not be willing to listen to you. If it is, uh, if the, the, the your discussion is getting too long, the person might not actually get the message, or the message might actually be lost. If it is too short, the message might not be gotten. So to give an example of all this context so that you understand uh, what we are discussing. This is proxemics. Examples are law abound. We we'll have false proxemics in the car or in the elevator. You should know that if, if the message you are trying to disseminate, it requires space. You are crammed cram together in an elevator, that's not the best time to actually do, to, 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 to disseminate that kind of message. In the supermarket aisle, waiting room privacy, parking, park bench seating, or you're in the classroom, you must know what the message you are trying to pass actually requires so that you, you, you disseminate it properly. The kinetics are the no, of non-verbal combination. An example is when you nod, these are the kinetics, just like uh, the, the shaking of the head, the eyes rolling, the tapping of the feet, the crossing of the arm, or when you mirror somebody, or you whispering, or you clench feet, or you talking, somebody is actually looking at his or her wrist, whether there's a research there or not. It's a sign to tell you that um, you are becoming boring, you are taking too much of my time. Vocalics, like I said. Vocalics, oh, this is wrong. Uh, but vocalics is uh, the tone, the modulation, the rhythm of the of 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 of, of the of your of your of your sound when you pass the message across. Then chronemics is the punctuality you have in meetings, the timings of not during the conversation, the brief glances, the duration of handshakes, all those things are part of uh, chronemics. The next uh, point of discussion is influence, psychology of persuasion. 
influence is just uh, when we say influence is you know, the summary of it is that you want someone to say yes to the request you've made of them. You are a safety officer, you are an official health and safety officer or professional. You are actually suggesting control measures. You are suggesting an intervention that is going to save um save your organization money or save your organization from injury and incident or accident as case might be you want your management to tell you yes you want her to tell you yes so that's your question or you are trying to convince your fellow workers on um, how best possible to go about the activities you do in a safe manner Despite the fact that um, you know some of, some of them have been doing it wrongly for a number of years and they are so used to that, doing it that wrongly, they say, "Wait, they tell you I've been doing this for long. I don't want to change." But uh, you know, you want to convince them and make them say yes to whatever you are bringing. At this junction, I would like to pause and actually uh, make a bit of clarification. At a point in time, depending where your organization is on the um, um, safety culture maturity uh, journey. Every occupational health and safety uh, professional will have to do this advocacy at any point in time. The volume at which you do the advocacy depends on where your company is on the safety culture maturity journey. If they are at the bottom of the ladder, you do more. If they are at the top of the ladder, just like we have um, HROs, highly reliable organizations like uh, you know people where you can't afford to make any mistake. Any mistake is catastrophic at that level. And they have actually embedded safety as a way of life, as a way of doing things. They don't care about the cost, what safety is going to cost them. At that level, you might need to do lesser of um, safety advocacy. But at the point in time, along the journey, you will do more of this. And it's very, very important to understand how we want to influence people, to make them say yes to what we have to say. And at the same time, so you might be thinking, I, I've been employed. I'm sure some of us have been in this issues before. You propose, you are this, um, the professional as a guardian of professional health and safety in your workplace. And you are telling them, this is a solution I have brought forth. And if you hear people trying to make tell you, you face objection, they tell you what's going on. And we can't do this kind of thing. Like, but you, that's why you employed me. You employed me to actually do this, to make your organization safe. But I'm at my crossroad, I'm, 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 I'm lost. I am actually doing my work, but you are, it seems as if you, you, you are bridling me. It's as if you, you, you prevent me from actually achieving the set goals you have you, you, you employed before. It happens. But the thing, I, like I said from the beginning of the, of, of the slides, is that um, ours is a live online job, which we must use passion and compassion to actually pray together. And we must use that to actually go about our our duties, no matter how, how bad it may seem, or how, how bad the objections are coming, we must make sure that we keep forging ahead. Remember one of the point that you are tired of the company and you want to leave, but uh, you, you can leave the workplace, but you know, not safe the advocacy. You might want to go peddle your way somewhere else, but as long as you are still in a place and you, you, you that, that's your responsibility, you must do it. That's why you are, we are looking for ways to make sure we get our message across as smooth as possible. Now, the sixth um, principle I'm, I'm highlighting here have been um, is a work of um, work of experiment done. It's a three-year experiment done by um, Professor uh, Robert Cialdini. He's a professor of psychology. Sat down and, and analyzed uh, different scenarios, different experiments to see that um, there are different uh, mechanisms how people make others say yes to their request. But as much as there are hundreds of tactics, they are bounded by these six principles. Uh, but the recent um, uh, reading I did, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a seventh principle by the same professor saying um, the, the, the principle of uh, unity, which we are going to get to in a short while. Reciprocation. Is saying that people are likely to say yes to people, to other people who actually have done some bit of things to them. Probably, you see, uh, I give you a bit of gift. When I give you this gift, there's this sense of um, urgency. No matter how subtle it is for you to actually, you want to reciprocate the same gesture back to me. You want to do something in return for me. That's why you see, we do this a lot. Uh, as a... Medical representative, I don't go 
consulting. I don't go meeting. I don't go prospecting without actually having one or two gifts that I give to the doctors I talk to, to the pharmacists I talk to, to the nurses. I go bearing gift as little as the, what we call the, the uh, you call pen or gadget, or at times it might be studies that have been done around my drug. You know, you you help them update their knowledge. If you, they want to listen to you. In the rest of now listening to you, you not begin to uncover. Then there's what we call the second principle is um, uh, commitment and consistency. Commitment and consistency. Once people are committed in bits to a particular cause, once they are committed in bits to a particular cause, because they want to be consistent, once you bring further causes, similar, they might want to actually uh, uh, want to you know, they want to be consistent. They will actually. Add buy by it and go for that. Let me give, break this down. You look at trends that are happening in the industry. Okay, you maybe organize a, 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 a uh, how do you call it now? You have a um, WhatsApp environment, they, you invite them, or you maybe you give you give gifts, handbook, safety handbook, or health checks and whatever you like. You are discussing with management. You've they've committed to a bit, you know, they've done that. Now you bring something that has been in the fore, uh, been at background before. You 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 add to that at the at the later stage. That is, you use the principle we discussed before to know when when best possible to bring this forth. And by the time you bring forth, since they've committed to something little before, and this is the same line, they will want to commit and be commit and be consistent. Then social proof. Social proof is um what we we'll call head mentality, head mentality, or what some people call peer peer pressure. Peer pressure in the sense that um, um, that is why in the workplace of uh, one to who are kind of safety champion or two safety champions, there is this peer pressure to people they want to actually be the next safety champion. You understand? And when you use that opportunity, right? You understand? The more safety champions you have, the more people want to conform and be safe. They don't want to be seen as the one breaking the rule. They want to, to, to conform. The fourth thing is of authority. The principle of authority. The principle of authority states that. When you are an authority, you should bring it forth and say it. You understand? Take for example, how does it feel? I want us to paint this. I'm painting a scenario. I want us to actually um, look at this scenario together. You are in uh, a departure lounge of, um, of an airport. So somebody suddenly collapsed. And the person collapsed, and everybody is surrounding the person. You understand? Trying to, you know, first aid and the rest. The moment somebody raises his or her hand and said, I'm a doctor, I'm a doctor, give way for the doctor. Everybody, they open up and they want to listen to the person because that person is their authority in that instance. If you have gathered enough authority in your field as a safety person, don't be shy to use it. Professor Child even says in some studies they conducted where it's a physiotherapy setting where um, a physiotherapist is trying to give advice to their patient, but they found out that people are not actually compliant with these advices. They went in and they get them to actually hand their diplomas, copy of the certifications they have at the back of them, you know, and give some bit of credibility and authority status to them. That alone actually changed, increased to level to 37% more compliance. They got some more compliance of you when people entered those offices and they conducted in such, in such kind of offices with their diploma at the back. And people, the patient can actually see this diploma. They know that no, this person talks to me, knows what he or she is doing. Then the fifth principle is um principle of liking. Very simple. They have to say, Al maru ma ahabba. that is a man will be with who he or she loves. Once somebody takes a liking in you, they listen to you. Once they take a liking in you, they, they listen to you. You must, before I interact to whoever, you don't get straight to the message. You make the context very, you make the context very conducive. When I say context now, I meaning you use everything. That is the uh, the proxemic, the chronemics, everything. You set the tune, you set the mood. The mood must be okay before you begin to now bring your advocacy to the fore. If you don't bring your advocacy, if you bring your advocacy in a place where those things are in disarray, you might get it. No. So once people like you, you'll be able to now use that. Then scarcity. Uh, well, I can remember really well when they were discussing scarcity, they said um, when um, uh, the Concord airline, the fastest airline, um, I think uh, from Ikeja to New York, it's uh, three hours, 20 minutes on the Concord. It's yeah, three hours, 20 minutes on the Concord. But as a result of um, um, uh, environmental concerns, uh, the French uh, carrier was uh, was stopped 
was about to stop. So they announced the uh, termination date for when they will be stopping operations. The flights for people that are picking it before, from experience group red, is not very red consistent. Other than it's, other than the point that it is a very fast means of communication of, of 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 transportation, it is noisy. It is uh, it's not that very 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 convenient aside from the speed, but and um, the sales while it was still in operation was fairly normal, fairly normal. But once they announced that it's going to stop, sales for tickets skyrocketed. Everybody wants to board Hair Concord. Everybody wants to board Hair Concord. Why? How do you use this in your advocacy? You must use this principle to your advantage in the sense that uh, you are providing a solution. You understand? You let them know. I will use this in marketing. So we we'll, we'll, we'll call it to we'll create some bit of urgency. People don't take action when nothing is urgent. Tell them by addressing this concern of us or by doing this our intervention, we will be saving this amount of money. But the window is closing because if we don't take action now, the incidents might, like, might likely happen any moment from now. And that's true. The moment operation is going on and it's not safe and um, you know the right prevention has not been put in place. Okay, yeah. Incident can likely occur. It's just a matter of time. They will occur. So put that into your message and say, oh, this is likely going to happen. So with sense of urgency, they might actually listen to what you have to say. Let me see. There's a video I have in the next slide. I don't know if it's going to play, but no worries. As part of um, what we'll be giving out, um, um, we'll have um, uh, this link will be in the in the presentation slides, and as well as um, the book itself. I'll be sharing the book itself. The two hundred and eighty-seven page the uh, page the ebook. You get to read it. You read the the experiments surrounding it. Let me see. I want to get. I want to play. Try this now. If you can hear the sound, um, I think you just do by show of hands. So let me know if you, you can hear it. Can you hear it? The co-host now. Can you hear no. the sound? No. No, please. Okay. Okay. I think I will leave that out. Like I said, uh, you 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 get it. You get the video itself. You get the um uh, the ebook as well. I've just uh, basically explained what um, the uh, principles are. The next agenda is um, overcoming resistance. In life, I think um, our life as human on Earth here yeah, is a life that thrives on resistance. It's just that when the resistance is becoming much, that's when we will actually give uh, we give up. But as a safety, occupational safety and health um, professional, you are going to face a lot of resistance in, in, in your practice. And uh, I've actually brought them um, 10 points that um, are a form of resistance that people will throw at you and tell you the, the reason why we are opposing this your uh, intervention is this. Uh, you see those 10 points. Safe, the common objection to safety measures often arise from various concerns and perce perceptions held by employees, management, uh, and other stakeholders. The how best you understand these um, objections is crucial for addressing them effectively. I want to go back to my story again. I think I am lucky to be trained by some of the best um, um, persons in the sales and marketing industry. I'll mention name. Pastor Elijah Mackey um, was the sales and marketing manager or director while I was in the, in the pharmaceutical company. He taught us um, how best possible to prospect. And he, I think I remember years ago, he mentioned how best possible you handle objections. He made us understand that um, uh, the objections you face are good signs. They are negative to some people, but they, they are opportunities. Imagine as a young uh, medical representative, discussing um, products that I am carrying with doctors. And you see doctors uh, puncture your ego by telling you, I already have a product I'm using. Why is this better? And you give them the example and say, no, I'm loyal to this brand. I'm good. I've used it. I'm, I'm good. Well, well, give this a trial. It's not a new drug in the market. It's been in the market. And these are uh, the studies showing why this is better than this. But you see them objecting. I said, there are ways you have the objection. There are ways you handle this objection. And how best possible you handle that objection? Objection is a potential, is a potential, somebody objects you is a potential ally in the future. How best you would fit that situation to advantage is, is how we are going to explore here. 
somebody tells you implementing these safety measures is too expensive. And um, uh, your response to them is you must emphasize the long-term cost savings from preventing accidents and reducing downtime and avoiding fines and legal costs associated with workplace injury in the sense that because you know once you see an injury, once an incident happens, the top part, just imagine an iceberg, you only see 10% of an iceberg. The 90% is down the water. You are not seeing it. You are not seeing it. Now, it doesn't mean it's not there, but it's there, but you are not just seeing it. It's much more than the initial cost. The direct cost of an incident is the tip of the iceberg. The indirect cost is what is below the water. Just imagine emotionally now we're thinking of people who are feeling detached from work, somebody in pain, physical pain, psychological pain. You can't, you can you maybe I don't know, but for some people that they can you can quantify what physical pain is. You can understand that okay, on the scale, this is how I'm feeling. But psychological pain, because you can't you can't touch it, it's so you know, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not something physical. You can't quantify how painful it is. And you don't want people to actually be there. I mean, once they are there, the morale of your workers, once it's not their production will definitely must die. You will tell the experience to them. And um, I'm supposed to go to the next um, next um, point, but before we go to the next point, we will likely discuss, when I was discussing the headphones and pathos and logos, the logos part is that you use, you infuse evidence and facts in your advocacy. The memos you write highlight why what you are actually proposing is the best for the company to take at that point in time. It's mm -hmm. very, very important you do this. It's very, very important you do this. If you have the facts and figures, look for them. Find a way to represent them in, in a manner that will show that, yes, this is actually the right step for us to take. Look at the following slides. I remember the last meeting, fiscal meeting we held, I would have held this as a workshop, but there was no time. So um, as occupational safety and health professionals, you must be able to actually do what we call annual return on investment on your proposed interventions. On your proposed intervention, if you look at the slides, you are proposing an investment. I want to say the investment. I don't want uh, there's this um, stigma against um, occupational health and safety professionals where we see interventions being as if we are just taking, we are just um, dumping cost, dumping cost. We are not generating revenue. You have to flip the speech. It's in your hands. Make them understand that, yeah, I might be taking cost, but it's an investment you are making. It's not as if you are I'm eating the money. It's not as if I, 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 I'm taking the money home. It's an investment you are making as a management. So to, to be able to tell them it's an investment, you should be able to do this calculation and put them in your advocacy. Either your verbal or your non-verbal advocacy, you should be able to tell them this investment I'm making. For example, you recommend an intervention worth um, four million naira, for example, you need to know that uh, what's the what's the what's the cost of the of of the injury or the incident. What's the total cost of the injury you are trying? Don't forget, you cannot actually quantify it, but as close as possible, you should do a quantification. How much is it going to? Work? For example, an incident is going to cost for the two million naira in the in the direct ones that we know for the two million naira to determine the ROI. You should divide this amount for the two million by four four million. You will get ten point five. So you multiply this 10 by 5 by 100 to get the percentage you are. You have a ROI of um, 1,050. What does this mean? It means that um, you've used 4 million era to actually prevent the company spending 42 million era if they don't actually bring this 4 million era now. It's a no brainer. Everybody wants to take that. Because if you are going to spend 42 million era of your money, in the future, would you rather spend four million naira now than spend for two million naira maybe in the next one month or, or two months? Now, for the business savvy ones, they want to know: okay, this for two million naira, this four million naira I'm spending based on my business that I'm doing. How soon can I recoup this money back? Which is going to lead us to the next slide. Okay, now this is the formula. You get it as part of the slide. Now, the, the this is we we'll call the payback period in months. For the for two million era proposed, um, the, uh, the the conceptualized incident that you are trying to prevent by spending four million era, you use you divide the cost of accident cost by twelve months. It's going to that means that if this accident actually final actually happens, the company is going to spend three point five million era per month in a year 
as a cause of as a result of the accident. But if you divide the formula intervention by 12, you get that means what you have here by that by that 3.5 million, sorry, what you have is 1.14 months. In under two months, you have paid back that money in comparison to the cost of the incident. In comparison to the cost of the incident. This is the second formula, it's going to be part of the slide. Once you put infuse this in your in your argument, it's you know you can't deny the fact. Then uh, what is now left is if somebody wants to be wants to be wicked, which I want to do frustrations so that people face. But if you give them the fact, you let their conscience prick them. They go home, they won't be able to sleep. They go home, their conscience continues to prick them and tell them they, they don't they won't sleep well. They know that no, this person have actually bring forth a necessary argument. I just need to take a, a step and um, uh, and actually ascend or ascend ascend to their to, to to their request. Now the next form of objection we actually face is time. They tell you safety procedure takes too much time and it slows down productivity. You tell them that a safe work env environment can lead to to can lead to more constant productivity by preventing accidents that can cause disruptions and delays. If an accident finally happens, that speed, that urgency you are having, everything stops. Have you not witnessed? When you are, uh, uh, you are uh, somebody is speeding, is rushing. By the time there's a, there's a, there's, there's an incident, probably be they hit somebody or they hit another car. You finally have to wait. I've seen this kind of number of times where you're traveling on the highway and you want to get as soon as possible cars that you leave on the road. By the time you park and you park on the roadside, and probably you want to actually ease yourself or stretch. They meet you within 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 minutes or within seconds. They, the cars you've left that you are not even seeing before you park, they meet you on that way. It shows you that um, for for so when you say they don't complain to you, they tell you this product you see, no matter where you are running to as a company, when the incident happens, you stop. In fact, that incident might even be what is going to take your company out of business. So you want to make sure that you listen to what I'm telling you. Inconvenience. They start this example. You know, they tell you the measures are inconvenient and it complicates the, 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 the workflow of the company. You tell them. You show them how safety measures can actually be integrated into the existing workflows. And that is your work. That's why you bring your expertise. You need to do some bit of risk assessment and know that the, the control measures or the interventions you are suggesting actually matches or can be integrated into your existing workflows. So to make sure that it guarantees minimal disruption and how they ultimately create a more efficient work environment. They might say, okay, it's, it's a case of complacency. We have never had any major accident. Why change now? People tell you, we hear that a lot, you understand? Somebody does something and say that it's not, it's not actually happened. And they're kind of laid back in there. Yeah, you know, I've, well, not that for, yeah, I've been doing this for the past 30 years. I've never had that situation before. It's not going to happen. But you are doing it the wrong way. And I've uh, forgotten, is it, is it Murphy's Law? Anything that is bound to go wrong will definitely go wrong. It's just, it's just a matter of time. You convince them, tell them, you stress the importance of being proactive rather than reactive. You know, being proactive saves life, it saves time, it saves you resources than being reactive. And you provide examples of companies that have that experience significant incident, despite having good safety record. How much more your company that does not have a good safety record? Are you going to be a match for them? Do you want to do you want to risk it? Are you willing to risk that? They tell you lack of awareness or understanding. I don't see the need for these measures. We don't know you not there. That's where you need to actually be first. Your, your your advocacy powers, your advocacy prowess, and you, you use them. They tell you, I don't see the need for these measures. You are the employees and management about the risk and the potential impact of not having proper safety measures in place. You use data, you use case studies, you use real life examples to illustrate these dangers. You bring forth LFIs from <laughs> you bring forth LFI from previous incidents, probably in the same industry, but necessarily in your company. If there are LFIs in your company, you use them. If the neighbor, if the people in your, uh, in, in your what you call your, your, your cohort or, or how do I put it now, your industry, the same sector which you operate, you bring those examples. The LFIs are there; they're online. You for I, I, I mean the um, process industry, I mean the oil and gas industry, I'm mean, of processes. HSC.gov.uk is, is one of those places you get this um, information. Um, the CBS.gov. Uh, is one of those um, um, sites that you get this information from. You review incidents and you see how meticulously they've done the investigation of these incidents and you see the learning from the incident that these incidents have shifted, the investigation have generated. Then naturally there's all we call resistance to change. 
it's resistant to change. We have always done it this way and it works fine. You explain the benefit of continuous improvement or continual improvement and how updated safety measures can enhance overall safety and efficiency. You highlight the evolving nature of safety standards and practices because they are not just stagnant. That you've been doing this for a year does not mean that uh, it's not, it, it keeps changing. It keeps changing, you know. They tell us, okay, well, this, uh, this is a risk now. This is a hazard. This hazard is new. This is this scare. You, you know, we, 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 you improve. And there's perception of, our, of over-regulation. They might want to see you are over-regulating this stuff. That's why as safety, as opinion safety and health and practitioners, uh, you must be wary of this, you understand. It's not every time you bring out the rule book, but that doesn't mean you should dump the rule book. Find a way to actually communicate your message in such a way that they don't see it as every time you are discussing regulation, but you are still discussing regulation. You know, there's a way you do it. You can say, yeah, according to the rule book, no, 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 no. You weave it into subtly, you throw it down. You throw it out subtly, you understand? No, no, the rule does not permit that. So what well, truth then you bring, you bring it forth? You will tell them you clarify the rationale behind each safety measure and how they align with industry standards. They are not just people sitting down or in a beer parlor and coming up with these things. It's, it's a work of experience, it's a work of work of consultation. You tell them and uh, show them how the compliance protects the organization and its employees. Then there's um, this, in the eighth point is the perceived lack of uh, personal benefit. What's in it for me? I don't see how this benefits me personally. If it is possible for you to tie this message across the neck and make them understand that the, 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 the intervention you are bringing is to prevent you from dying, it will prevent your friend from dying, so prevent your friend from getting injured, it will prevent you from getting injured as well. They might, you need to connect them with the message. I've seen, my little experience in life, I've seen that then when you connect people with the problem they might likely have, he, he helps them visualize it, he helps them want to take care, he makes them want to actually you know, pay attention. You emphasize the personal benefit of safety measures, such as reducing the risk of injury, enhancing job security, and improving overall workplace well-being. I've heard of cases whereby where there's a risk of um, fire or risk of explosion. And you need to infuse and say that once this place burns down, all of us will go home. None of us are going to end salary again. You understand? So don't bomb the farm, don't burn the farm line. What I'm suggesting to you is to make sure that the farmland continues to thrive much after we have gone. Then doubts about effectiveness, which is the ninth uh, point. I don't think, you know, the person will tell you, I don't think these measures will make any difference. Uh, you see where they begin to talk as if they are experts. That's why you need to bring your logos point of view. You bring it to the fore. You tell them, provide evidence. You must provide this evidence. You show them evidence of the effectiveness of the safety measures through case studies, testimonial, statistical data, showing reductions, in, incident, in accidents and incidents. You must make sure that uh, your communication is actually, you know, is noted. Probably if it's mail, you do it to them, let them know. You, you tell them word of mouth and you share it with them, let them see it and let them read it when they are convenient. Then the 10th point, 10th and last point is fear of repercussions. This is basically uh, what we've been discussing is between both management, how management and both uh, workers will actually um, re, re, over, bring forth some, some form of objection. Now, this one fear of repercussions is basically with the workers. It's the workers. It concerns the workers. They tell you, if I report these safety issues, I might get in trouble. And now, like I said, I'll have to refer back to the safety culture maturity uh, journey. Where we are on that safety culture maturity journey will dictate how our company, through policies and uh, objectives, how they handle whistleblowing, how empowered are they to stop work, how empowered are they to report um, near misses, or to repair on safe and safe conditions. How empowered are they? It dictates where we are on the safety culture uh, maturity journey. You, 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 you foster a culture that is for management. Now you encourage management to foster a culture where reporting is encouraged and valued. You, and you assure employees that reporting issues lead to positive changes and that there are no negative consequences for doing so. Addressing um, these objections, like I said from the beginning, with clear, logical, and empathetic care. Uh, uh, responses will help gain support for safety measures and build a stronger safety culture within the organization. Like I said, uh, the kite does not fly, uh, or the kite, the airplane does not fly with the wind. They fly in objection to the wind. Uh, it's a message I'm trying to pass across. You fly a kite against the wind. The airplanes fly 
against the wind. If the airplane uh, looks at the objection, look at the objection and they refuse to fly, you will not, you will not will get nowhere. So the objection is part of our daily, our daily, is part of the things we face on a daily. And we must use it our advantage. Know that it is possible for you to flip somebody, bringing forth an objection and make them your ally. You can flip them. You can flip them. It's possible to do that. We have discussed some um, um, three principles, um, the ethos, pathos, and the logos. And we'll discuss um, the, um, the context of, um, of um, getting your message across. We'll discuss the uh, proxemics. We'll discuss the, um, um, the ob uh, objectives and, and the we'll call it artifacts. We'll discuss the kinetics. We'll discuss the uh, opalistics and the vocalics and the codemics. And at the same time, I brought for the sixth uh, principle of um, of influencing people, uh, like I said at the end of this um, presentation, we will we'll, we'll make it um, available for people to actually have access to. Maybe we will share it in the comment section where you get access to to the book uh, "Influence" um, by Robert Cialdini to take for you to read. But you, uh, if you don't want to read, there are video summaries which is going to be part of what we'll be sharing. There are video summaries where you can actually read, listen through and listen to the process again, the, the principles again, so that you find a way to actually make use of this in your day-to-day -day activity in, in your state of advocacy. I'm urging each and every one of us to take this initiative to our respective workplaces. Whether you are introducing new safety protocols or you are enforcing existing ones or advocating for a culture of continuous safety improvement, remember that your ability to persuade effectively can make a significant difference. With this difference that we are making, will make us go to bed at night and know that, yes, we have not only earned our pay, at least you have done something possible for the for the workplace, for the whole world. At least you've been able to prevent injury, you've been able to prevent um, um, fatality. Your commitment to safety advocacy is not just about compliance. It's about protecting lives and pushing a safe, productive work environment for everyone. Thank you very much for listening. Chair, now the floor. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Fatu Abdullahi, for that um, insightful session. It's really been a great time with you, and um, we're excited to be in this meeting. So I've listened to all you've shared with us. Uh, I'm very sure we have um, uh, persons here that have questions or contributions. You can see we are about 71 uh, participants on this call. So I'll be giving uh, opportunities for those that have comments or questions to please um, unmute yourself and ask. And so those of you that would like to share yours in the chat box, please um, go ahead to share it. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Thank you very much, and uh, oh, Mr. Fatiu, thank you very much for sharing your insight about this. It's actually my first time after a long period of time, why a year, and um, I learned a lot. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I just have a question. Um, my major concern is around how do we actually calculate Haru High for some incidences? especially the unknown, um, how do you, for indirect cost, how do you, how do you do that to be able to persuade the management to buy your idea? That's my question. Thank you. What's your name, sir? Bukola. Thank you very much, Mr. Bukola Ogunleke. I was just going through the chat. I want to say for somebody else, I never knew you were the one asking the question. Um, like I said, I'll be sharing the slides, but uh, let me quickly just um, highlight let me go back to that. I didn't want to dwell on it, but for you to actually, let's repeat a scenario. Um, you are trying to actually maybe, you know, suggest why the company needs to actually put in something simple, such as, let's say, fire prevention measures. Fire prevention measures. You know, because, because fire prevention is different from firefighting. But let's just say, let's take a, the common one that people know, firefighting, for example. Firefighting, like um, extinguishers, various forms of extinguishers, CO2, um, ABC, and the rest, you know, appropriate extinguishers. Why you want to buy extinguishers is that, okay, 
if all other measures fail, and if I start small, if I start small, you want to be able to nip it in the bud as soon as possible so that you prevent escalation. Yes, yes. Now you know the um, the value of the you've done your scope, the amount of um, the numbers of executions you are buying. Let's say it's that four millionaire. You are buying maybe ten executions, for example. It's ten million. It's, um, it's four millionaire. Or uh, maybe you are buying uh, fifty executions for for four millionaire. The incident cost now, which is where your your which is your question, which I what you asked, you need to look into history. Fires of this magnitude, if you fire, if you look at this, what you are trying to protect, maybe the organization. Now, if this organization burns down to the ground, how much is going to cost? Or if the section, if a section of the of the company burns down, how much is going to cost? That is at that make that forty two million there. Then you proceed from there. You proceed from there. I hope um, I have been able to explain to you. You either use um, hypothetical situation, which is the direct one. You can't actually quantify indirect cost. No. But for the direct one, you can use history. And at the same time, you can use a common sense. You can ask right questions. If this space burns down, how much is it going to cost? What's the worth of this building? So are we willing to lose this building because we are, really, we are asking for this amount to be spent? I hope I've addressed your question, Mr. Bukola. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Bukola. Mr. Fatsu, for the response to the question. Um, does anyone else have a question or comments? Or I'll quickly go to the chats and um, read out some questions we have. Um, there is one here from Mr. Kennedy. How can one manage gifts and reciprocity from cultures where gifts are frowned at or even considered a form of bribery? Over to you. Okay. Thank you very much. The responsibility is actually wider than gifting. Gifting is part of it. But uh, once you, let me, uh, I want us to believe that um, you are in the same organization. You understand? You are in the same organization. It's not as if you are a regulator, you are going to regulate or, so, or somebody is coming to your, or your premises. If it's within an organization, you understand, you should be able to understand. I can't give my colleagues something. But um, the right one I'm actually suggesting in reciprocity is that actually it might not be a physical gift. It might be a, be a good gesture. Take, for example, you uh, you ask after them, you understand. You take a genuine interest in them, you understand. Aside work, you understand. You Let me paint a scenario. At the point in time while I was still with uh, my previous company, I was carrying the, the product called Supertab TN. Is a brand of superfoxacin and timidazone. If this drug is used for curing basically um, ENT, that's ear, nose, and throat infection. So I need to, there's a particular doctor in town. I can't remember his name really well, that many years. It's called Dr. Dr. Coco. Yeah, Coco or something like that. Short dark man, you understand? I paid a special interest in him, you understand? I visited him in his uh, private practice, you understand? I went to meet him, you understand? But before meeting him, I had done my reconnaissance. I had gotten the information about him, the children, his wife, his family, you understand? Information you can use to, you know, you know that gesture. I visited him, you understand? And, you know, the kind gesture of you paying compliment or paying attention to those kind of things. Just that there are some things, intangible things that would do, you understand? Just visiting without you stating what you've come from. I just came to look after you and everything. You know? There's this urgency they feel when you finally bring forth, when you bring your situation, you know, what actually brought you. Once you finally bring that, you know, they are obliged to listen to you. Same situation I've used before FMC Jalingo. FMC Jalingo is known um, in St. Jalingo. I was supposed to go there, but there's a pharmacist there called Pharmacist Hassan. Yeah. Very stern pastor. I was supposed to, he has, there's a bit of, there's a problem because I was not a pharmacist. So he doesn't listen to non pharmacists that are medical representatives. So people are already saying, uh, we'll see how we are going to get uh, pharmacist uh, Hassan's attention because he's the he's the one in charge of presentations. If I want to make presentations to doctors and nurses, 
I need to go through pharmacist hard time. I doesn't listen to people that are not that are not pharmacists. So when I met him, I didn't the first time I met him, I didn't meet him as as I'm coming from my company. You understand? I had met him a couple of times before now meeting him again. You understand? It was much more blood that he, he forgot about the fact that his principle of asking, are you a pharmacist? He never asked me, and I put my meeting and I made my presentation. So it's not about just giving fiscal gifts alone. It's about give gifting. And there are even instances where you can actually make use of them. Take, for example, you as the occupational safety and health um, 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 professional, you might have done some bit of research. You can give them that report. It's not a report you are mandated to, have to, 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 to forward to them. That's okay, I will just do some bit of research. Something that's going to benefit them. It might be, you might have interest in playing golf and you've noticed that you, noticed that you saw something, an article about golf playing, you shared with them, you understand? Or something they have interest in. When you ask for it down the line, when by the time you bring it forward, you are not a stranger. You have closed the gap. There's no distance between you, whether physical or psychological. You closed it, so you'll be able to, to bank on that. And you are not just using one. Where one is not, when one of the person is not um, applicable to you, you fetch others. If it's possible to blend the seven, or the six together, go ahead. If it is two, you can use. If it is one, go ahead. You don't use them in isolation. You use them together as um, it's possible. I hope I've been able to answer your question. Mr. Kennedy. Thank you very much, sir. Oh, okay. Is it Mr. Israel reading the question? I'm done with the question. I have the oh, questions. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, please, with your question. State your name okay. and tell us who you are before you ask your question. Thank you. Okay, sir. So my name is um Adeke Abib. Um I'm a safety, I'm in the safety business also. <laughs> so I I work in Benin. My question is related to what someone asked earlier on on indirect cost. Okay. So I'm just I'm thinking about the question and I'm, I want to get clarity. Okay. If sir. if there was an incident in a company that led to a fire like you exemplify and um, the fire leads to some certain level of destruction in the company and you can quantify the direct cost which is destruction of some property and all that assets of the company. Can we also classify indirect cost as the as a result of the incident? What led to degradation of the environment, for example? Um, what affects um, 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 what's it called animals or something, you know, within the environment? And costs that are related to maybe sanctions, litigations, and fines from regulators. Can those kinds of uh, costs be classified as indirect costs? I'm just, you know, thinking. So Thank I want you. to get clarity on that. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Adike Abim. Um, those are part of um, direct cost. Direct cost are those things you can actually place figures on. Direct cost of the incident, you know, like you said, the cost of the incident, cost of litigation, cost of restoring the environment, cost of loss of environment, you understand? You put those things together. But for the indirect cost, where you can't place a figure, no matter the figure you get for direct cost, you should be able to highlight to management, tell them based on experience or from industry, the indirect cost that we are not even putting on this on this table is much more than this. But let us work with the one that we have, which is the figure. I hope they will understand that. If I've got it 10, if the cost of the direct cost is 42 million, for example, is 42 million, for example. And um, I will, can tell them indirect cost can be as much as 300 million if you look at it, it's depending on the industry. If you look at, um, you know, there are a lot of things, you know, at play, but you work with the direct, uh, this in calculating the ROI and the annual return on investment and, uh, you know, payback time in months. I hope I'm able to answer your question. The question is saying you can order costs that are, that you can, things that you can place cost on, as well as direct cost related to the incident, as a result of the incident. Thank you very much. Okay. I, I uh, understand perfectly now. Thank you, son. All right, I think to, to add to that also, uh, research have, uh, has shown that uh, the indirect cost of accident is eight to 36 times more than the direct cost. Okay, so that is uh, from research over the years. Okay. 
So you you can use that as a as you know as, as a measure. You know. As a measure. Thank you very much, Chair, for the insight. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Sus. Thank you, Mr. Fatu. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Um, we'll be moving to the next um, segment on this um, call, and um, is the presentation of um, the certificate to Mr. Fatu. Mr. Fatu, really want to appreciate you. The IOS Network is glad to have you uh, present this to us, this topic on persuasive. Uh, persuasion to us today and um, we really want to express our gratitude by presenting this um, certificate to you. Um, I'm unable to share it right now on my screen because I don't have that as I don't have that um, right to share uh, but um, we'll be I don't know the uh, chairman is here. Mr. Chairman I don't know if can you present from your own end or Mr. Kennedy I can't present from my end. I can share my screen. We will do that uh, before we close the meeting. Or well, you can proceed. Right. We can proceed with the with the, with the meeting. All right, sir. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> I'll be calling on.